Hi, welcome back to our study of Revelation. It's great to be with you all again. We're in chapter two, today starting the second of seven letters that John transcribed for Jesus to seven churches in Asia Minor, what today is Turkey. We're reading other people's mail, but in this situation, it's okay because it's in the Bible. Today, we'll cover the second and the third letters. So let's pray and then we'll get started. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, throughout history, you have been at work in our world and in the individual lives of your people. You have been at work in individual congregations. There was a church, Lord God, a long time ago in seven cities in Turkey. There are churches there today. We are part of a church here in San Antonio because you are at work in our world and in our individual lives. Thank you, Father, for all that you do for us every day. Thank you for the gift of your Holy Word. And as we spend some time in your Word now, we pray the gift of your Holy Spirit in rich measure. Teach us what you would have us know. Help us to believe what you teach us and to live what we believe. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. Let's go straight to God's word. Look at Revelation chapter two, verses eight to 11. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. This letter is the shortest of all the seven letters to the seven churches. Smyrna was one of the principal cities of Asia Minor and vied with Ephesus and Pergamon for the title of first city of Asia. A Christian church with a bishop existed in Smyrna from a very early time in church history. Earlier, we looked at a passage from Acts 19:10 when we read that all the recipients of Asia heard the word of God through Paul's preaching when he traveled here on his third missionary journey. Some scholars conclude from this passage that this is when the church in Smyrna began. It happened sometime late in winter in the year 56. We know that much information. The letter begins with what I like to call a return address. Jesus identifies himself as the first and the last who died and came to life. We've spoken about this before. In chapter one, John records for us the spectacular vision of the one he saw. Each of the letters begins with an abbreviated portion of that description, a small snippet. And this is about the only part of each letter we can interpret with absolute certainty. The rest of the letter, refers to events and circumstances about which we can only guess because there is nothing in scripture to help us interpret specifically. Sometimes history helps a little. The letter mentions tribulation. To the best of our knowledge, this is a reference to persecution. We do know that about 50 years after Revelation was written, persecution was still going on in Smyrna. We know that because Polycarp, one of the fathers of the ancient church, was bishop of the church in Smyrna and was ordered by the authorities to deny Christ or be burned at the stake. Polycarp replied to that order by saying, 80 and six years I have served him and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king? and my Savior, who has saved me. 
Tradition records that the flames failed to kill him. So he was stabbed to finish the job. Persecution happened in the ancient world. It happened in Smyrna. It continues to happen in parts of the world still today. The letter also refers to the believers in Smyrna as being in poverty, then adds the note, but you are rich. Once again, there's no way for us to know precisely what these words mean. One possibility is that the believers in Smyrna were financially poor, but spiritually wealthy. It makes one think of the words that Jesus one time spoke when he asked, what can a man give in exchange for his soul? All the money in the world cannot save us. If we had everything but did not have Jesus, we would have nothing. But if we have nothing and do have Jesus, then we have everything. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Luke 12, verse 15. And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. One's life does not consist in the abundance of one's possessions. It appears that the believers in Smyrna lacked material wealth, but were rich in the things of the kingdom of God. And they needed all the spiritual wealth they could come by because of the hardships they were facing. Some of that hardship came from people the letter describes as those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. These are very harsh words. And once again, there is nothing to help us identify precisely to whom they refer. One possibility is that there were Jews in Smyrna who added to the persecution of Christians because they rejected the teaching that Jesus was the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. In the first chapter of his gospel, John wrote about Jesus that he came to his own people and his own people received him not. Remember Nicodemus? Nicodemus was the first person in the history of the world to hear the marvelous words that God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. But Nicodemus heard those words in the middle of the night because he felt he needed to hide his faith at first because of all of the people who opposed Jesus, Jewish people. In his gospel, Mark tells us that the first time Jesus returned to his hometown and preached in the synagogue he grew up in, the people took offense at him and their rejection of him prevented him from doing any mighty work in his hometown. Mark tells us that Jesus marveled at their unbelief. The Greek word translated marvel in that passage means astonished out of one's senses. In his account of the same event, Luke tells us that the people in the synagogue were so furious at Jesus that they drove him out of their town to the brow of the hill on which it was built and threatened to throw Jesus off the cliff. Many of the Jews, perhaps it's more accurate to say most of the Jews, did not believe that Jesus was their Messiah or that he was the savior of the world. Before he became the apostle St. Paul, Saul was a Pharisee, part of one of the strictest Jewish sects, doing his best to wipe the name of Jesus off the face of the earth by persecuting all who believed in him. When Paul was converted, he was on the road to Damascus where he intended to arrest people just because they were Christians. There were Jews who intentionally and with determination 
did whatever they could do to erase the name of Jesus off the face of the earth. Perhaps this is what was going on in Smyrna and the reason why John labeled them a synagogue of Satan. If you recall, we've spoken before about how insistent John is on the teaching that Jesus is the only way to heaven. John is the one who quoted Jesus saying, no one comes to the Father but through me. In John 8, we read that because the Jews did not embrace him, Jesus told them that their father was the devil and they wanted to carry out the devil's desires against him. Whatever was going on, it could not have been good because John goes on to tell the believers in Smyrna that Jesus told them not to be afraid of what they were about to suffer. Behold, Jesus said, if you recall, this is the Bible's word for listen up, pay attention, you don't wanna miss this. Listen up, Jesus said. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. We've spoken a number of times about how God tests the faith of his people. And then we run across another number, like so many numbers in Revelation. For 10 days, you will have tribulation, John quoted Jesus as saying. Do the words 10 days mean precisely that? A span of 240 hours, 10 days? Or is this another example of how the numbers in Revelation need to be regarded as symbolic, not literal? Are the words 10 days an apocalyptic example of saying just a short time, only 10 days, not 10 weeks, not 10 months, not 10 years, 10 days? Nothing in scripture allows us to interpret this passage any more precisely. As I've shared with you before, my opinion is that the numbers in Revelation are symbolic. Jesus said 10 days to indicate a short time. What follows, however, holds no mystery whatsoever. Be faithful unto death, Jesus said through John, and I will give you the crown of life. This is a message that appears often in scripture and in Revelation. Be faithful unto death. Don't give up, don't quit. No matter how hard it becomes to keep the faith, never give up. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The letter ends with words we've seen before. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then adds a word that raises up a whole new set of questions. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. The second death is mentioned three additional times in Revelation. And the words second death are not found anywhere else in the Bible. Each of the references appears to tell us that the second death is the death that follows physical death, spiritual death, the death of eternal separation from God. When our hearts stop beating, and our brain stops functioning, and we're no longer breathing, that's the first death. But that death does not prevent us from living forever with God in heaven. But if we die, if our heart stops beating, our brain stops working, and we stop breathing, without Jesus, Then we die a second time and that death lasts forever. 
Look at Revelation chapter 21, almost at the end of the book. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. We'll look at this passage in more detail when we get to it later. But for now, it's enough for us to see the connection between the words, the second death, and the words, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which are consistent with how the Bible describes hell. The second death is being thrown into hell. The two additional passages appear to confirm this understanding. Look at Revelation 20, verses 14 to 15. Revelation 20, 14 to 15. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And all those whose name is not written in the book of life are thrown into the lake of fire. The good news in this passage, and we'll spend more time looking at this also, the good news is that death and Hades, and we've spoken about the difficulty of interpreting the word Hades, death and Hades will be thrown into the lake of fire, the lake of eternal destruction at the end. And now look at Revelation 20, verse 6. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Again, we'll look at this passage more closely later also, especially the mention of the first resurrection. But for now, this passage appears to confirm the idea that the second death is spiritual death the death of eternal separation from God, which comes to all who are thrown into the lake of fire, into hell. And here the letter ends. This is the shortest of the seven letters. So let's go on to the third letter. Look at Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamon write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast to my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Once again, there is what I like to call a return address. Jesus identifies himself as the sender of the letter. And he identifies himself as him who has the sharp two-edged sword. We've spoken about this before. It appears to be a reference to the word of God. All the recipients of the seven letters lived in places where their lives were made difficult because of their faith. Those who lived in Pergamon may have had the most difficulty because Jesus described where they lived as Satan's throne. Satan reigns where you live, Jesus told them. Satan controls 
where you live. Scary thought. At one time, Pergamon was the capital city of the Roman province of Asia Minor. And it was known for its spectacular architecture, including a number of idol temples. It's possible that this is why Jesus said it was Satan's throne. It was a center of idol worship. Among all the temples, one was dedicated to the worship of Caesar Augustus. Yes, that's Caesar Augustus, the emperor. Remember, some of the Caesars declared themselves divine. It was a fairly common practice in the ancient world. Egyptian pharaohs did it all the time and insisted on being worshiped as a god. Twice, Jesus connects Pergamon with Satan, first calling it the place where Satan's throne is, and the second time, declaring it is where Satan dwells. The second time that Jesus connected Pergamon to Satan is because it was where Antipas, his faithful witness, was killed. This is the only place where this particular Antipas is mentioned in the Bible. There was a Herod Antipas mentioned in the Gospels, totally different person. All we know about the Antipas in Revelation, all we know with certainty is what we read here. And we read that he was a faithful witness to Jesus and he was killed for his faith. In Eastern Orthodox tradition, there is a Saint Antipas that is connected to this person in Revelation. According to this tradition, the Apostle John ordained Antipas, Bishop of Pergamon, during the reign of Nero, which happened between the years 54 to 68. And the tradition further teaches that Antipas was martyred under Nero by being baked alive inside an oven shaped like a bull. Persecution happened in the ancient world. To their credit, the believers in Pergamon held fast to the Savior's name and did not deny their faith in spite of all the horrors they experienced and the temptations they faced. And some of those temptations came from the idol temples. Food sacrificed to idols was always the best quality that included the best meat, the best cuts of meat, and the best produce. After being sacrificed to the idol, some of the food often wound up in the common marketplace for sale. And because it was of high quality, it was desirable, it was the best. And that created a crisis of conscience for believers. Was it okay? Was it right? Was it appropriate for believers in Jesus to eat food they knew came from an idol temple and an idol sacrifice? This question caused the ancient church huge problems. Paul writes about this problem in his first letter to the Corinthians in chapter 8. Some ancient believers said they knew that idols were not real, so it made no difference whether they ate food from idol worship or not, because idols don't count for anything. They're not real. But other believers said it was a betray betrayal of the Christian faith. Paul wrote, that the believers were no better off if they did eat idol worship food or if they didn't eat it because food does not commend us to God. But, Paul continued, because eating food offered to idols could seriously harm the conscience of a brother or sister in Christ, it was better not to eat it. 
that we can't understand because there's nothing comparable in our culture. Maybe there is. Because of all the bad stuff that happens in entertainment, is it appropriate for Christians to watch TV? Some Christians say no. And some Christians say yes. Food from idol worship was a huge problem for the ancient church. And food wasn't the only temptation. Idol worship often included sexual immorality. Throughout the ancient world, temples were dedicated to gods and goddesses of fertility. And the way to promote one's own fertility at home was by having sex with the priest or the priestess at the temple. The practice has been labeled sacred prostitution. A connection between sexual immorality and religion even found its way into the disaster of the golden calf that the people of Israel worshiped when they were traveling in the wilderness that Aaron made for them while Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving from God the Ten Commandments. Exodus 32 records that horrible episode for us and it tells us that after sacrificing to the golden calf, the people sat down to eat and drink and then got up to indulge in revelry, to play. The Hebrew word translated play and revelry in that passage is the same word used in Genesis to describe how Isaac fondled his wife, Rebecca. It's a word with sexual connotations. In some translations, the word is translated sporting with. It has to do with sex. God created sex and God created it good. But sex has always presented temptation and connecting it to religion just made the temptation so much harder to resist. In his letter to the church at Pergamon, Jesus connected his condemnation of the people who had lost their way to Balaam and Balak, whose story is recorded for us in Numbers 22. Balak was the king of Moab and Balaam was a priest Balak hired to curse the Israelites. But all that ever came out of Balaam's mouth was a blessing because God was speaking through him in spite of his wickedness. Balaam and the Moabites lured the people of God away from worshiping him only to indulge in the worship of their idols. And some of the members of the church in Pergamon were doing the same thing. Along with this danger, Jesus also mentioned the Nicolaitans. We've read about them before, we've studied them before. They appear to have been part of the heresy of Gnosticism, a heresy that taught that nothing we do with our bodies, no matter how sinful, matters at all because our bodies don't matter at all. All that matters about us is our spirit. Some people kind of talk that way even today. It is a terrible untruth. The Bible says your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says honor God with your bodies. But the idea that we can do whatever we want with our body is so very tempting. Repent, Jesus told the believers in Pergamon and cautioned them against all who had lost their way. Repent, or I will come to you soon and make war against those people with the sword of my mouth. Jesus said that we cannot serve God and mammon. We cannot divide our devotion to him. 
God calls us to love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. But here's the good news. Jesus will not let those who wander away from him be lost without putting up a fight. I will come and make war, Jesus said. As with the other letters, this letter ends with the same word of caution. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Pay attention to these words. Don't let them go in one ear and out the other, Jesus warned. Learn from the mistakes of the churches and do not make the same mistakes in your own life. And then, like in all the other letters, Jesus makes a promise to the one who conquers. We've looked at this word closely before. I will give some of the hidden manna and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. The hidden manna appears to be a reference to the feast of salvation, to eternal life. A white stone is a cultural reference to the practice at ancient trials of rendering a verdict. The accused were condemned to death when juries returned a verdict of a black stone. Each juror voted by casting a stone. A white stone made, meant acquittal and life. A black stone meant instant death. Jesus, the judge of all, will give a white stone of acquittal and life to all who follow him and conquer. And the reference to a new name being written on a stone appears to be a cultural reference also similar to St. Paul's name change when he was converted from Saul to Paul. At their baptisms, ancient believers often took new names to indicate the beginning of their new life. Some of you have heard me tell this story more than once. Shepherd of the Hills Lutheran Church in San Antonio partners with Cristo El Salvador in Del Rio to do mission and ministry on both sides of the border. Members of the churches there are strongly encouraged to take on personal ministries and to commit themselves to those ministries. One lady on the Mexican side of the border chose ministry to prisoners in the jail of Ciudad Acuna as her personal ministry. Every week she went to the prison to share the gospel with the prisoners. In time, she became well known by the prisoners. Late one night, one of the prisoners took a hostage and threatened to kill him with a crude knife he had fashioned in prison. The guards did their best to talk him down. Finally, he said he wouldn't talk to anyone but the lady. So the guards called her and asked her to come to the jail in the middle of the night. And she was eight months pregnant at the time. She went to the prison and talked to the prisoner. And close to dawn, he surrendered his hostage and the knife and asked her to baptize him. She eagerly accepted his request. Water was brought. She read scripture and prayed with him. Then as she began to apply water to his head and to say, yo te baptizo en el nombre, I baptize you in the name of. The prisoner interrupted her because she was using the wrong name. She was using the only name she had ever known for him, but he said it was the wrong name. He interrupted her and said, my name is Theophilo. I want to be baptized in my real name. So she baptized him. Theophilo, she said. Yo te baptizo en el nombre del Padre y del Hijo y del Espíritu Santo. When they were done, she asked why he wanted to be baptized in that name. He explained that it was the name given to him when he was born, but he had forsaken it 
when he had become a criminal because the name means one who loves God. And he didn't think that was a proper name for a criminal. But now he was a new man. He was a believer. He loved God. And he wanted everyone to know that. Jesus has given each of us, all who are faithful unto death and conquer, the gift of hidden manna, of a white stone, and a new name. He's promised us eternal life. And it's a promise that will never be broken. Let's pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, for most of us, following Jesus is pretty quiet. There are no extraordinary stories for most of us. Most of us perhaps were born into Christian homes perhaps grew up in the faith. We've known about God and about Jesus our whole life. And some of us have more dramatic stories. However we came to faith, Lord God, whether we believe for a long time or a short time, we praise you, we praise you for the glorious riches of knowing you, the only true God, and your Son, Jesus, the only Savior. And we pray that by your mercy, we would follow you unto death and be faithful. Help us to conquer and to come to receive the crown of life. Wherever we are, whatever is going on in our lives, Help us always to hear your voice, listen to your word, follow you and love you. We ask it in the precious name of Jesus, the only Savior. Amen. See you next time. Stay well. God be with you.